The United Nations and the U.S. State Department try to broker a Middle East ceasefire, but the death toll continues to rise. No exemption for religious employers as the Obama administration adds new protection for gays in the workplace. Thousands of Iraqi Christians flee the city of Mosul after Islamic militants give an ultimatum. And dozens of kids enjoy dinner at the White House at the third annual Kids State Dinner. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, July 21st, 2014. Good evening from Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick looking at your news now with new efforts looking for a ceasefire. The Israeli military says seven soldiers have now been killed in a firefight with Gaza militants. That brings to 27 the number of Israelis killed in the conflict, including two civilians. More than two thirds of the 500 plus Palestinians who have died are civilians. Israeli strikes are leaving entire families buried under rubble. Hamas militants have been trying to sneak into Israel through a pair of tunnels, firing more than 50 rockets. Meanwhile, two U.S. citizens are now among the dead as U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry arrives in Egypt trying to broker a ceasefire. Max Steinberg, a native of California, served as a sniper in the Israeli Defense Forces. Sean Carmelli of Texas served in the IDF as well. The two U.S. citizens are among 13 IDF soldiers killed on Sunday. Hamas military wing claimed to have captured an Israeli soldier. Israeli officials deny this but say they're looking into it. Israel's incursion into the town of Shafai sent hundreds of people fleeing into Gaza City. The Gaza Health Ministry says more than 500 Palestinians have now been killed. The United Nations estimates about 70 percent of the dead are civilians. We have no war with the people of Gaza. Once again today, Israel agreed to a ceasefire. The third time that Israel accepted and Hamas rejected a humanitarian ceasefire. Israeli forces say they've destroyed several tunnels used by militants to smuggle weapons and facilitate attacks in Israel. And since the beginning of their ground operations last Thursday, officials say they've exposed 16 tunnels with 43 access points. After meeting an emergency session, the U.N. Security Council is expressing concern about the rising death toll, calling for an immediate end to the violence in the Middle East. The Palestinian U.N. ambassador called that a test for Israel. If they are going to abide uh, by all these elements and to stop this aggression against our people. Some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. A warning from religious leaders about a new executive order signed today by President Obama. The president calls the order protection for gay and transgender workers from discrimination, but some faith groups see it as yet another attack on religious freedom. More from Wyatt Goolsby, who is at the White House tonight. Wyatt? Yeah, Brian, today President Obama said it's unacceptable that being gay is still a fireable offense in most places. So he signed into order today something that provides employee protection to gay and transgender workers who are contractors for the federal government. But some faith groups say that President Obama left out one key part, and that's a religious exemption for religious organizations. So the president signing an order on discrimination in the workplace is nothing new, but Presidents Johnson, Bush, and Clinton all have signed laws on this issue. But today, President Obama expanded past laws by adding explicitly gender identity to the list of protections. Quality in the workplace uh, is not only the right thing to do, it turns out to be good business. That's why a majority of Fortune 500 companies already have non-discrimination policies in place. It is not just about doing the right thing. It's also about attracting and retra uh, retaining the best talent. And there are several business leaders who are here today who will attest to that. The president has held off on signing an order on this in the hopes that Congress would take sweeping action on the issue. But since it has not been taken up by the GOP-controlled House, the president signed this order. Now, Catholic bishops here in the U.S. say any unjust discrimination against anyone is wrong. But they say, at least they've said in the past, that laws like this are not the solution. Why? They say the core issue here is the difference between same-sex attraction and same-sex conduct. They say, in essence, that this legislation is protecting same-sex behavior which goes against the teachings of the church. Brian.
Wyatt Goolsby at the White House, thank you. And we're glad to welcome back Allison Howard from Concerned Women for America. Allison, is this executive order going to affect faith-based businesses and religious organizations? Well, what the president did today is codify into law exactly what it purports to address, and that's discrimination. Here, uh, the president only really can address federal contractors and federal employees, so he stepped up to try and classify sexual identity, gender identity, as a, a classified uh, group of people to end this discrimination. But as he said so well, let the free market work. Uh, there are laws in place already to end discrimination. And what he's done, again, is attack and assault people of faith, people of goodwill that just don't simply agree with him on uh, sexual identity and the benefits of, of maleness and femaleness. And that's a problem. Was there any opportunity for input before this was issued? Yeah, Congress has been talking about it for a long time. The American people are having a healthy, robust discussion on what this bill, which was called ENDA, uh, would do to businesses, what was best for Americans, for families, women and children, uh, and our country as a whole. And yet again, he stepped in here to try and answer it for all of us. And so I think it's really frustrating. I think it's frustrating for the American people. It's frustrating for Congress, uh, men and women who are working on this with their constituents when he steps in and tries to, to end the discussion. The president says about 90% of homosexuals and transgenders have been uh, somehow discriminated against. How can we protect everyone's rights while not actually signing off on his, his take on sexuality? Right. Well, it wasn't too long ago that the president stood with most religious groups on sexuality and marriage. Uh, this is his evolution towards something. And honestly, Brian, it's really sad we're here. Uh, I wish we weren't here talking about this. It's sad that we can't come together and work towards really great and big things that we could be doing and taking the heavy hand of government off of businesses, allowing people to run their businesses according to their deeply held convictions. And if those deeply held convictions run them out of the marketplace, then so be it. But that's the kind of country we live in. That's what's so great is that our civil liberties were always protected and it doesn't end when you open a business. From Concerned Women for America, Allison Howard, thank you for your input tonight. Thanks for having me. Well, Malaysia's prime minister says pro-Russian rebels have agreed to hand over both black boxes from Flight 17 to Malaysian investigators who are now in Ukraine. That flight was shot down last week over eastern Ukraine, killing all 298 people on board. The prime minister of Malaysia says the remains of most of the victims will be handed over to Dutch authorities and flown to Amsterdam. He says international investigators will be given safe access to the crash site. President Obama is making an appeal to Russia tonight. Now's the time for President Putin and Russia to pivot away from the strategy that they've been taking and get serious about trying to resolve uh, hostilities within Ukraine in a way that respects Ukraine's sovereignty and respects the right of the Ukrainian people to make their own decisions about their own lives. Obama accused pro-Russian separatists of removing evidence and bodies from the crash site. He says it raises the question, what exactly are they trying to hide? The White House, of course, confirms the missile that brought down the plane was fired from an area controlled by the separatists. As we find out more about the passengers who died that tragic day, Arjun Ryder was a leading researcher at Western Australia's Department of Agriculture and Food. He and his wife, Yvonne, were returning from the Netherlands where they were visiting family. Ryder's brother is leaning on his faith, trying to find forgiveness. Our entire family, we're strong Christians. We, our faith is very important to us. And part of that, that faith tradition says that we should forgive those that have wronged us. And um, in this case, you know, we know that there was, there was some terrible things that were done. We don't know who, who was responsible. Uh, it's not important for us to, uh, to, to come after those people. Uh, if anything, we want to forgive them for uh, some things that they've done here that um, uh, they shouldn't have done. By the way, dozens of AIDS researchers and workers were on board that flight traveling to a conference in Australia when the plane was shot down last week. Meanwhile, friends and teachers gathered today at a Malaysian university praying for Muhammad Afif. He and five members of his family were killed. Close friends remembered him as a funny, caring and kind person. He's a person who will lift up your spirit I mean, when you're down. He will make jokes so you'll be happy. So that's how I'm going to remember him. He's, a, he's the funniest person I've ever met, but he's really kind. He would help you in any way. It was a Taylor University located in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia's capital. Elbridge Colby, a Robert M. Gates fellow at the Center for New American Security, joining us now. Bridge, the, this has been four days now, and this site 
and the bodies and all the evidence has been under the control of these separatists who are suspected of shooting this down. Hasn't the investigation been totally compromised? I think it's unquestionable that it's that it's been compromised, Brian. Uh, I mean, I think we've already seen indications that certain materials may have uh, been taken away from the site and even across the border with, with Russia. Um, I think, you know, there's a, a great amount of evidence that will be available even uh, uh, with a compromised crash site. So uh, the, the story's not over, but... Uh, but I think there's no question that it's been, it's been compromised. So this area is technically Ukraine. It's 25 miles from the Russian border. It's under the control of these separatists. Uh, President Obama is saying, you know, Russia is going to get more sanctions if it doesn't step in and help. Is this going to be enough to get something done? Well, I think there's a, there was a promising move actually before the, uh, the, the, the plane went down to uh, the U.S. imposed more sanctions. Actually, what's, what's more encouraging, what's going on right now, is that the Europeans seem to be moving on the sanctions issue. That had really been the, the hindrance before uh, because the Russian economy is much more exposed to, to European economies. So I think that there's a real possibility there. Of course, we have to be conscious uh, that, that these sanctions have to have a point and have to lead to some kind of de-escalation. But I think it's, it's pretty clear right now that more pressure needs to be applied, and that seems to be the direction things are going. There's a lot of speculation that Russia provided the weapons, perhaps the training. Can any of that be proven? I think it, I think it probably can. I mean, it's all, it all depends on the eye of the beholder to some extent, but Secretary Kerry was very emphatic that the evidence, uh, even about the SA-11 surface-to-air missile, was pretty dispositive. I think Russia's involvement is, is, is pretty clear, and it's, it's, a, it's a thin read. Uh, uh, that, uh, that the Russians are using to hide their, their, their involvement. So, Very dangerous territory we're getting into here, but we appreciate your input. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Pope Francis makes a call for dialogue to resolve armed conflicts, especially in the Middle East and Ukraine. He said, violence is not overcome with violence. It is overcome with peace. After Sunday's Angelus, the Holy Father led tens of thousands gathered in St. Peter's Square in a silent prayer. He's urging everyone to keep praying for peace in the Middle East and in Ukraine. He also expressed concern for persecuted Christians in the Iraqi city of Mosul. Now, Christians in that city face an ultimatum, convert pay a tax or die. Our Jason Calvi is here with that story today. Oh, Brian, you know, Islamic militants gave that choice to Christians in Mosul. The terrorist group known as ISIS took control of that Iraqi city last month, and now Christians are running for their lives. Our future is uncertain. Our house is now gone. They took it and put it under their name. They wrote Islamic State on it. Now what? They took our things, our bags, our money, everything we had on us. This Christian family escaped Mosul. The Islamic militants gave them a Saturday deadline to convert or else. Actually, what happened in the last few days in Mosul is a crime against humanity, a crime against those families who are living safe in their homes. This Anglican minister is pleading for help from the UN, the EU, and the United States. Intervene on the ground, not with moral support of speeches and conferences. We want real support on the ground, a military intervention to settle this problem which the country is suffering from. We want them to support the Iraqi security forces and the army. Christians have been fleeing to the nearby Kurdish region in northern Iraq since April, and many more joined them this weekend. But the terrorists couldn't take these Christians' faith. This husband and wife now sit peacefully in a churchyard, surrounded by family and signs of their faith. In Arabic, this sign says Jesus is the light of the world, and tonight Iraqi Christians turn to that light in a dark world. You know, church leaders estimate the number of Christians living in Iraq may have shrunk in half since 2003. Before that, around one million Christians lived in the country. The patriarch of the Chaldean Catholic Church says Iraq is heading to a humanitarian, cultural, and historical disaster. Brian, he made that comment in a letter to all Iraqis. Thank you, Jason. As our Holy Father said, we need to pray for the people there. Thank you very much. People living in Florida in a town say they're stunned to hear of police ties to the Ku Klux Klan. Florida's Department of Law Enforcement revealed last week that two officers in the town are accused of being Klan members. The officers are no longer on the force, by the way. Klan ties surfaced four years ago when an officer resigned after his connection to the racist group became public. The Southern Poverty Law Center says it's extremely rare these days to find police officers who are Klan members. Well, Texas is calling up the National Guard to help counter immigration overload. Governor Rick Perry is sending up to 1,000 Guard troops to the Mexico border. They'll supplement the 3,000 Border Patrol agents already assigned to the border. Governor Perry has repeatedly asked President Obama to deploy troops, 
And during the president's recent visit to Texas, Perry tried to convince him to visit the border to no avail. Governor Perry has also announced that Texas will spend another $1.3 million per week to assist in border security through the end of this year. Coming up, a jury deliberates the fate of a friend of the accused Boston Marathon bomber. And actor James Garner has died. Did you know he was a decorated veteran married for more than 60 years? Monday, July 21st, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. Jurors in the trial of a friend of the Boston Marathon bomber, Johar Zanaya, found him guilty of obstructing justice. Azbata Zayakov was accused with another friend of removing items from Zanarov's dorm room three days after the attack. Three people were killed and more than 260 injured when two bombs exploded near the marathon finish line in 2013. Prosecutors say two men took the accused bomber's backpack containing fireworks that had been emptied of explosive powder from his dorm room hours after the FBI released images of the suspect. This weekend marked two years since a man opened fire in a Colorado movie theater, killing 12 people and injuring dozens more. James Holmes is the sole suspect in the mass shooting. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity earlier this year. His trial is scheduled for October 2014. This was the deadliest shooting in Colorado since the Columbine High School massacre in 1999. Colorado was the first state to allow the sale of recreational marijuana, but some voters say pot should not be allowed in bars and clubs where alcohol is sold. That's the finding of a Quinnipiac poll released today. The majority of Colorado voters still support the sale of recreational marijuana, but two-thirds say pot should be used only in private settings. Colorado law bans smoking pot in bars and restaurants, but some private marijuana clubs are opening. Two Purple Hearts, a marriage lasting more than 60 years and an acting career spanning generations. These all embody James Garner, who died this weekend at his home in Brentwood, California. Our Catherine Zeltner looks back at his life of 86 years. Acting never came easy for James Garner. Born James Baumgarner, the actor described himself as a painfully shy introvert, masking the condition only with effort. Mind over matter. I literally had to do it saying, you know, if you, you can't have this attitude and be an actor, and I had to change. Garner pursued acting after dropping out of school to join the Merchant Marine. Later in the Army, he earned two Purple Hearts fighting in the Korean War. He got his big acting break in 1957 as the lead in the offbeat Western series, Maverick. At that time, there were like 16 Westerns on uh, television, and uh, we stuck our tongue in our cheeks and uh, made them laugh a little bit and smile, and I think that was the difference. Garner moved easily between television and film roles even before that became the rule for actors. The 1966 film Grand Prix provided a glimpse into one of Garner's longtime fascinations, auto racing. The versatile actor landed the role of Jim Rockford in the detective series The Rockford Files in 1974. Aren't the police on it? He won an Emmy Award in 1977 for his iconic role and continued to work after the show ended its six-year run. He shined in films like Victor Victoria and Murphy's Romance, which brought Garner a nomination for a Best Actor Oscar. I'm not a lifeguard. I don't put up fail, and I'm not your damn Dutch uncle. His career came full circle in the early 90s when he took a supporting role in a movie based on Maverick, playing the father of his original character. Now, well, I remember my first runaway stage. <laughs> and in an HBO production of the satirical Barbarians at the Gate. In 2000, Garner was back in the big screen in the action film Space Cowboys. Why the hell not? The easygoing actor returned to television in the comedy Eight Simple Rules in 2003. The following year, he co-starred in The Notebook. The romantic drama was an instant hit and endeared Garner to a new audience. I read to her and she remembers. Garner's ability to excel in both television and film made him an easy choice to be honored by the Screen Actors Guild with a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2004. The father of two, who remained married to his wife Lois for nearly 60 years, won't be soon forgotten. Catherine Zeltner, EWTN News Nightly. Up next, Italians honor Our Lady of Mount Carmel with a regal neighborhood procession. And the baby prince is about to celebrate his first birthday.
It's good to have you along this evening for EWTN News Nightly on Monday, July 21st. I'm Brian Patrick and a Roman neighborhood honors Our Lady of Mount Carmel over the weekend with a beautiful procession. A statue of Mary is carried from the Church of St. Agatha to the Church of San Francesco and then to the Church of St. Crisogono for the night. At the end of the procession, a band greets the statue with trumpets. The celebration continues through this coming Sunday when there will be another procession. The statue is then put on a boat across the Tiber River, commemorating the long history of Marian devotion of Italian fishermen. They would pray through Mary's intercession for a bountiful catch. Meanwhile, Rome prepares to mark 2,000 years since the death of its first emperor. Octavian Augustus is widely credited with bringing peace and stability during his 41-year rule, two millennia since his death. A special sound and light show in the Forum of Augustus celebrates his legacy. Rome's greatest emperor again towers over the temple he once built. A light show tells the story of how Augustus came to power when he was 18, after the assassination of his uncle and adopted father, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was very ambitious, um, and Octavian was equally ambitious, but he was more like a wolf in sheep's clothing and that he hid his ambition a little bit better. He said, for example, oh, I don't want to have too much power. I'm just here to help. Also known as Octavian, Augustus is credited with bringing stability to the Roman Empire by using his power wisely. He was quite popular among Romans because he could relate to the common man. He dressed very simply. He wasn't very flashy. His wife also was you know, a paragon of female virtue, always seen weaving. I mean, we don't know what was going on behind closed doors, but this was their way of um, assuming power, but in a, in Italian we say piano, piano, in a very slow and subtle way, and it worked. And then in the end, he ruled for 41 years, so he must have done something right. And not only that he ruled for 41 years and did something right, but in retrospect, we call this the era of peace, the golden age of Rome. Over the decades, Augustus launched public works projects, roads, aqueducts, and Roman theaters. His legacy and his story draws thousands of tourists to Rome every year. Many marvel at the tactics he used to transform the decadent Roman Republic into a thriving empire. Events marking the 2000th anniversary of his death on August 19, 14 AD, run through October. White House state dinners are fairly common here in Washington, but this one is unique. It's the third annual Kids State Dinner. Friday's event recognized 54 winners selected in a healthy recipe competition as part of Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative. The kids created an original lunchtime recipe that's healthy, affordable, and tasty. The Kids State Dinner features a selection of the winning recipes, and while they were eating healthy, the president admitted the first family indulges every once in a while, sharing their secret junk food cravings. Maybe I shouldn't say this, but it's not like our family, including me, don't have, you know, some, some snacks once in a while that, <laughs> that may not be, you know, on the perfect nutrition chart. Um, it's true. And, e <laughs> you know, each of us have our weaknesses. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal some right now. Um, uh -oh. Malia, uh, ice cream. I mean, basically, uh, it's very hard for her to turn down ice cream. Yeah. Hard for me to turn down ice cream. Perhaps Malia enjoyed some ice cream yesterday. Sunday was National Ice Cream Day, a tradition started by President Ronald Reagan 30 years ago. Now that is true bipartisanship. Well, maybe they'll have some ice cream tomorrow. It's a big day for a little royal. Check out the new photo of Britain's Prince George. He turns one tomorrow. The young prince is the first child of Prince William and the Duchess of Cambridge, Kate Middleton. This picture was taken during the future king's recent visit to the Natural History Museum in London. As you can see, he is now walking. I love his coveralls. Starting a new style there. Well, we remind you to uh, download EWTN's app. You can watch us anytime that way, either live streaming or you can look for a video on demand. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again anytime you like on EWTN's YouTube page or on the app. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you again for watching tonight. Good night and God bless you.